This is about defending democracy. This is no longer Democrats versus Republicans. What do you want your kids to believe in? There must be give and take. This is White Flag with Joe Walsh. Former Congressman Joe Walsh here. So there's a group I recently found and have become a really big fan of. Starts with us. They're a movement working to overcome the extreme political and cultural division in America. You can find them online at startswith.us. I love them because they're showing people it's possible to have real, meaningful, productive conversations with people you disagree with. I'm a big, big fan of this. This is what I try to do on my podcast. Because right now, right now in America, we have two major political parties that are at each other's throats. And the most dangerous aspect of this is that it's led many of us to avoid having hard conversations with people we disagree with. We're afraid to have these hard conversations, afraid to deal with the tough stuff, so we walk away. But to save our democracy, we have to stick around. I mean, if we all walk away from the table, then who the hell is sticking around to figure things out? This is what I so love and admire about the work that Starts With Us is doing. They're sticking around. They are the movement for people like you and me who wanna fight the extreme political and cultural division in this country. Because guess what? People like us, we are in the majority. Starts With Us found that 87% of Americans are tired of how politically and culturally divided we are. So yeah, I'm not just a fan, I'm part of the movement too. And if you're listening to me right now, I want you to join the movement as well. Go to startswith.us and get their free newsletter. Sign up for their free newsletter. Get involved. Start there. Startswith.us. Thanks. Flag with Joe Walsh, former Congressman Joe Walsh with you. And today I'm with uh, Brian Karam, um, longtime American journalist, uh, reporter investigative reporter, longtime White House correspondent. He's an author. Uh, he's currently White House columnist for Salon.com. Great book that Brian Karam put out last year called Free the Press, The Death of American Journalism and How to Revive It. And I think I want to get into that a little bit with my guest today. I go into these conversations uh, generally believing I've got a disagreement with my guest, and I do, but I'm, I'm, uh, this is going to be a, this is going to be a home court advantage for my guest because Brian has been in this business of journalism forever. Uh, blah. And, blah. He's an old <laughs> fart and he's committed to a free press and he's committed to rightly uh, analyzing how fucked up our, uh, our journalism and media profession is now. Brian, long introduction. Thank you, my friend. Let's start here. Always a um, pleasure, brother. You wrote a piece, I don't remember when, but I read it, in Salon.com, great piece, uh, a month or two, maybe three ago, that jumped out at me. I'm forgetting the title right away, but in, in the title might have been, or it wasn't the title, but... You, you, you basically said American journalism is driven by capitalism. Yes. And then you walked your way through that. And I want to get into some of that, especially with where you believe and how you believe we need to improve journalism. But let Brian, let's start there with that sentence of yours. American journalism is driven by capitalism, to which the libertarian in me would say, well, duh. So what? Big deal. Take it away. Why is that bad? <laughs> well, the problem. Look, Cap. I, I'm a I'm a happy capitalist, uh, Joe. <laughs> you know, I have a book. It's called Free the Press. Buy early. Buy often. Buy buy yes. ten. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm a happy capitalist. The problem if capitalism is the only, it, it needs to be regulated because the if it's the only driving force, right? You know, the demand curve slopes down. You buy the things, you know, economists will tell you, you buy things that you want. So you are going, if 
capitalism is the only driving force in journalism, then what you get are people buying stuff that they want to hear rather than things that they need to know. And, and why, and while that's fine, if you're, you know, if you're buying a jungle gym or if you're buying a car, sometimes news is not what you want to hear, but it's what you need to know. And when you, when you take away guardrails to make sure that what you're getting are facts, um, because it's solely driven by capitalism, then what you end up having is are people sitting at the top of the food chain going, well, gee, I, I need an audience. All these people think this. Let's keep them in their informational silo and sell them what they want to hear. And facts are oftentimes messy things. They You need to vet them. They need to be things that you mm-hmm. do not want to hear. And that isn't necessarily what you want to buy. But is so, it, Brian, that, and that, that, I, I agree with a lot of that, and that makes sense. But you, again, in a free society, you and I are consumers. The guy down the street from me right now is a consumer. He can choose where the hell he's going to go online to check out what happened today. Or, or he can news. turn everything off. Or turn everything off, or what cable news show to watch, or what yeah. newspaper to buy. Like, that's always going to drive it, right? Yes, but what we've done in the past and what we've removed, and look, make no mistake, this is not a Republican or Democratic uh, issue. This is uh, every president, every president, every Democratic president, every Mm -hmm. Republican president since Ronald Reagan has destroyed uh, the, the boundaries between pure capitalism and journalism. There were, you know, there were limited ownership, so you could only own three or four properties. There was the fairness doctrine, which dictated that if you put something of a controversial nature, you need to have a, a another side of the story to it, so that people would have be able to to you know to see facts and and judge for themselves what the truth is. So back up a minute, back up before we get into some of those things. So what you're saying, Bry, is that. And correct me if I'm paraphrasing you wrong. It's always going to primarily be driven by ca- uh, capitalism. American media is. Let's call it media. The way we've got it designed today, yes. Uh, is it always going to... But won't it always be primarily, in a free society, driven by capitalism? Well, if you're a capitalistic nation, but I mean, you can be free and not be a capitalistic nation. But that's... My point is that Here. what happens... Yeah, yeah. What happens if you've played the game of Monopoly, which is a great capitalistic game, is at the end of, at the end of the game, one person owns everything, and that's not what you want with capitalism. Now, and, and I'm I would, you know, it, it's well regulated capitalism that generates competition, healthy competition that created the society we live in. Unhealthy competition, unhealthy capitalism is when one or two people or three own a monopoly. And that's why we bust. It was Teddy Roosevelt, who was a trust buster, who busted up, you know, uh, monopolies. And so the idea behind the regulations that we had on journalism was to make sure that there were as many independent voices as possible that owned a lot of different properties. So the libertarian view gets in, the Republican view gets in, the Democratic view gets in, minorities get in, Everyone has a voice. But so, so, so again, before we get into some of these specifics, yeah. just so I know where you're coming from, you, we live in a capitalist free society. Uh, you're not arguing for the government to control the media. You'd like to see more regulation of the media. Is that? I don't want anybody to control the media except the owners and the participants in it. But I want it well regulated, so as many voices, and that's a fun look. That's a fine. Some will see that as control. Oh, you're controlling us. Well, no, I, I want to make sure that there is many. It was Ben Bagdicki and the former uh, editor at the Washington Post that said you will not have real diversity of thought until you have diversity of ownership. And when I am speaking of diversity, I'm not speaking just of the diversity of or black and white. I think that's too binary. No, no. I think, that, yeah. Diversity of ownership means everyone has a voice. Um, and to, to that point, when I got into this business, there were 20 or 30 companies that uh, oversaw about 80% of what you see, read, or hear. Today, there are six major corporations that own more than 90% of what you see, read, or hear. 
the conversation you and I are having now uh, will reach many people. Uh, how, much, how many more people would it reach if it were on a streaming service owned by Disney? The, the, the uh, resources that the large corporations have to bring the word to the American public uh, are far exceeds what you and I can do. And you know that, and I know that. And that's, uh, so I want to level the playing field so as many people as possible can be heard. That people, look, we always make the mistake in this business, in my business, of going, we're here to tell you the truth. And that's BS. No. I'm not here to tell you the truth. I'm who's here to truth? present. Yeah. Who's truth? Yeah, who's, who's truth? truth? As, as Indiana Jones said, you want truth? That's philosophy. Two doors down. We're here for vetted factual information. And we'd be in much better shape today if we dedicated ourselves to doing that instead of pretending that we we are the keepers of truth. That sounds so arrogant to me. And every time somebody says it, I just want to slap them across the face. So, 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 and to get there, to get a more level playing field in our media, Brian Karam, yep. it's going to, in your mind, it's going to take more government regulation. It's going to take a reinstitution of a regulation. When you say more, reg, more government regulation, that sounds uh, you know, onerous to, to many people. Oh, I don't want the government, but this is stuff that we already had. I'm not asking for a, a, a large scale ramp up of regulating the media. I'm asking to return to the norms that gave us media that everyone trusted. And if you think it don't, it didn't work, take a look. It, everyone loves to look at the past and go, hey, you know, where are the Walter Cronkites today? Hey, where is the, the real news day? Well, there was a reason why Walter Cronkite was Walter Cronkite. We created an environment that allowed Walter Cronkites to become knowledgeable, have the gravitas, and do what they did. Today's journalism, because of deregulation, has become a very different animal. I used to have five or two, you used to have to have five or ten years of experience working somewhere before you could go somewhere else to a larger publication. Walter Cronkite was a was a well experienced reporter before he became Walter Cronkite, and you believed him, and people trusted Walter, Uncle Walter, because they knew he had the experience. Today, there are people covering the White House, Joe, and it's frightening to me every time I see it. There are people, you know, you used to have five or ten years of experience to get there. When I first walked in the Brady briefing room, that first row, it was it was Sam Donaldson and said, Brian. Look at that first row of, of in the Brady briefing room. There's probably 200 years of experience there. Listen to all of them. And then he made a joke, you know, that Helen Thomas had 190 years of it. And 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 she, and she said something smart to Sam. And Sam said, hey, it's okay to have an unexpressed thought. And Helen said, Sam, when it comes to you, you have a lot of unexpressed thoughts. And I, I thought, I don't know what I'm doing for the rest of my life, but today's a great day. So anyway, but you look at that front row of the Brady briefing room today, there's half, maybe a third of that. There's there's seven people sitting there, and I'll 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 be damned if there's fifty years of experience versus two hundred. But but you need it, that experience. Okay, let's. You threw a lot there. Let's let's look at Walter, yes, I did. Walter Cronkite. We we look back on this on this age, this myth of this age that it was so great, and Walter the Walter Cronkites of the world they put the truth out there and the facts. Again, again, Brian, Walter Cronkite, we learned, maybe people knew it then, but we learned since, was a hardcore lefty, a pretty damn left to center guy who gave you his truth. Um, it, it wasn't. No, he gave you facts. When, and when well, he gave you truth? No, Joe, when he gave you truth. Everybody's biased. He, in your business, yeah. everybody's biased. Everyone's biased in, in life. And so, and so I don't. Was I don't bias. I, I don't buy into this objective thing about journalism either. We need to be objective. No, we just need to give you the facts. My what I think doesn't really matter. You know, I I've had reporters come to me and go, and that's another issue. You know, local journalism. What what has happened to you know? And we can get into that. But I've had reporters come to me and go, "This is what I think," and I go, "I don't give a shit what you think. I barely care what I think. What the hell do you know?" It was his ability to dig out facts. It was his sources. It was those things. Now, when the difference was when Walter Cronkite gave you an opinion, he labeled it an opinion. Yeah, okay, but but well, he, and he didn't he didn't give a lot of that. But again, the, the greatest power, Bry, the greatest power that people like Cronkite had back in the day was deciding what they were going to report. 
and bias is exactly. inherent in that. But, he, it, but, he, but bias is inherent in choosing what my top story or two or three was is no. going to be. And he had no competition, Bri. Like you get pissed off. Oh, yeah, plenty of competition. He had Huntley Brinkley. He oh. had Huntley Brinkley report for one was was competition. One. The New York there were what two to three networks back then. Radios. There's no competition today. There are twice the number of people on this planet is on the day that I was born, half the number of reporters. There you, are. Wait, 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 Brian. You don't believe for the average American today, you and I can question the quality of a lot of the news sources, but the average American today has a gazillion times more news outlets and sources no. than they did back in Crockett's day. No, they don't. They've got they this have... thing called the internet. They've got cable yeah, news. That's They've got journalism. Street... Well, no, well, Bry, it may not be your kind of journalism, but it's no, news. No, it's not journalism. It's, 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 it's like saying it's not my kind of medicine. There's, there's good medicine and then there's bullshit. Look, if you want to be a journalist, if you want to really be a reporter, I, you need to have a lot of experience in how things run in the government or sports or, I, I mean, you can call yourself a sports reporter or a, a movie reviewer, and that doesn't make you one. What makes you one is the experience understanding how the things operate and having sources that can talk to you and to know how, what your legal rights are and how to, and most importantly, more important than all of that is if you're going to be a journalist, you need to have someone else who looks over your copy at the very least, you need a copy editor. And a lot of newspapers don't even have those today. And I would venture to say that a lot of newspapers are no longer newspapers or organs of journalism, but merely propaganda and bullshit. But Brian, you, have, you, you, you today, have, you can be a 28-year-old young man who starts a website called therealnews.com or whatever and puts shit up every day and millions and millions can go to your website. You are a news source. You can no. call, hold on, hold on. You can call yourself a journalist. You may not like it. I may not like it, but the country is littered with this stuff now. And I, I, it, it's and, and some will make it, it's some won't. Shit, but nonetheless, that's not journalism. Well, but, but uh, yeah, Brian, I'm old school in that regard, brother. I don't, I don't find, I find blog. Look, it's all allowable under the First Amendment, you know, free speech, and I'm all for it. And I don't think any of them should be taken down. But the problem is that we've lost the ability to to mute to have a a shared reality of vetted factual information. And it's not my facts versus your facts. It is the facts. Mm -hmm. And that we've lost, you know how we've really lost it? It isn't, it isn't above in, in the national news. It's here. Here's where it is. It's in community journalism. The, these vulture capitalists, you used to be limited on the number of newspapers that you own. These vulture capitalists, and I call them vulture capitalists, some of them, like the Alden Group, some of them own four or 500 newspapers. And what happens is, for example, if you work for Gannett, the Courier Journal, I always use an as an example. Mm -hmm. The Courier Journal was an independent newspaper, Des Moines Register, uh, all these newspapers, Indianapolis Star, and Indianapolis Star was a it was a family-owned newspaper by a very right-wing bunch of people, but they put out news, and people respected their news. They didn't necessarily respect their, you know, and often had differences of opinion on their editorial page. But those newspapers provided information for communities and they helped bind us and shape us. For example, you may disagree with me on one issue. I'll disagree with you on another. But all of us pretty much agree that we'd like to have a paved street. We'd love the schools to be open. We'd love a, a, the police department to work. We'd love for the hospitals to work. Why aren't they working? Local newspapers were the ones that provided that information. Okay, those stop, stop, stop. You're right, Brian. But what if there's no readership or no audience for local newspapers anymore. There is, the there is, there is a, an audience. Where? Now, the, the government has destroyed it well, by, uh, and here's how they've destroyed it. They, that, that audience is there. They want to, you still want to know if the, if all these things are going on that I've just mentioned, those are things that affect you on, on an, uh, on a daily basis. You don't see them many places. The government used to have things called, uh, uh, government notice ads, notice of publication ads that under uh, was underwriting uh, a lot of local newspapers. That was 
advertising that was you had to have a third party that presented the information like if we're going to announce a, a meeting the meeting ads uh you, you uh, classified ads that so you know like when you sold like uh, estate sales all these things that had to have public notice these public notice ads what has happened is many governments many of them democratic many of them republican have decided that it's cheaper for the government to post those notices on their own website as if newspapers didn't have a website now so they're not by, subsidizing the local papers anymore. more importantly in in addition yes you're correct and more importantly and that was a subsidy that helped out pay reporters salaries and it's one of the reasons that many small community newspapers were were were, were you know salient were were able to work but when you remove those, you not only undercut, it, it does two things. It not only undercuts a local community newspaper, but more importantly, it means that you have to trust the government without a disinterested third party observer to tell you what is going on in the government. And that's dead wrong. And both Democrats and Republicans have taken advantage of that. It's led to, it, it's led to vast media deserts as newspapers close. And guess what? Here's a great example. Montgomery County, where where I live and you, in you, you, you yeah, Montgomery yeah. County, Maryland, when I first moved there, had a daily newspaper, two weekly newspapers, two radio stations, and yeah. the Washington Post. You sound like you're an old fart. There's no market yeah, but for listen, that anymore. It, it's important. It's important because there are, for example, there are city councils across this country where there are no reporters covering the city council. And in fact, sometimes what the reporter does is stream a, a video of the city council meeting without being there, without asking questions, without knowing what's going on. It is destroying coverage. People still care about whether or well, not Brian, to be you say screwed. that you say that brother and i love but you don't people. care if you're screwed on your taxes. No, no, you don't no, care no, if there's no, a pothole. You don't care if there's a police I think department. People, I think People care, but you say people care, but there's no market anymore for local there is. newspapers. I, I, come on now. I've been in it for 40 years. There's a market there. Every, Why are every they all year. then going or have gone belly up? If, because no one is selling ads and no one in this. In, why, in, why is no one selling ads? Because there's because no we readership. don't know how to do it. Because what we've done, the government has removed itself from newspapers taking out the subsidies that allow us to hire people. Thus, in, as we cut back, we hire cheaper and cheaper individuals who are fresh out of school, who have no experience. And it's, it's all a, a spiral downward. There's no investment in the product. There's no investment in the future. Sure, I pick up most of my news on, a, on an app, and that's not wrong to do. You can sell, as everyone has shown, and newspapers weren't able to do, was to make those profitable. So it's a, it's an ongoing problem. It's not that people don't care. It's that there's no way to, and it's not that they won't buy it. It's just that we don't know how to sell. Respond to this. Respond to this. I, uh, you, you mentioned the fairness doctrine. I, I, a couple things, and then respond. I think it's a myth that broadcast TV and radio back in the day, in the glory days, were ever fair and balanced. Uh, as I've looked at the fairness doctrine and how it was used, especially in radio and then in TV, man, it was, it, it was a tool wielded by establishment interest. I mean, FDR went after radio stations. Uh, JFK went after radio and TV stations. Uh, uh, before the fairness doctrine, broadcasting, radio and TV broadcasting was more diverse. Uh, but then radical voices, I, I mean, you had environments where radical voices on the left and right were heard, new immigrant voices. And then the, ra the, the radio act and, the, and then the, the, which was the precursor to the fairness doctrine and all these things came in that, that kind of got rid of all of these voices, especially any voices critical of government and I'm about to shut up, which goes to my point. I don't want the government to determine what content on radio, TV, or anywhere should be acceptable content. I, I just either. think it was more diverse before the fairness. Document. It wasn't, and, and studies will prove that it wasn't. The problem, what 
it, what the fairness doctrine did, and look, let's be honest, fairness doctrine was never used to prosecute anybody. But what it did was serve to put those who own the properties on notice that if they want to get their uh, licenses renewed, then they had to make an attempt. They had to show that they were making an attempt to be fair. Why is that? Why is that? To, why is that fair, Bry? Why is it like? And, and in one of the rulings back, why in is the what fair? Is getting, is getting it, opposing viewpoints. No, yeah. Why is it proper? It led to the fairness. Hold on, doctrine, hold on, hold on. Answer this. Why let, is it proper for the government to tell the owner of a local radio station? that you cannot advocate for your point of view unless you present no, another point of that's view. that's not what it says. Well, it, it, back no, in the day, no, it did. That's it, not what the, no, it did not. It yeah. never said that. Joe, yes. the fairness doctrine was, look, you want to advocate for what you want. Now you are guaranteed an avenue to do it. That's what the fairness doctrine gave you. And before the fairness doctrine, all these, uh, you know, like meet the press and all those things that where you hear all these opposing viewpoints, they didn't have them because... The, the broadcasters didn't give a shit and didn't care. The government says, no, if you're going, we'll give, you know, it was one hour a week was all it was like, if you ever saw broadcast news, it's a great thing. You know, it, all they said was one hour of the week, you've got to give, you know, you can charge whatever you want, whatever you, whenever you want, but for one hour a week, you've got to do this and, and give the news. And that was pretty much all the government did. The fairness doctrine was there to determine whether or not they were actually providing public service broadcasting. It led to news as you and I know it, but the fairness doctrine was simply said, if you broadcast that, uh, you know, uh, on contra and look, you, you can determine what a controversial issue is. All that the fairness doctrine was ever used for, all that it did that was good was provide public service broadcasting, which led to, much more freedom in the marketplace than we have today. If you take away the fairness doctrine, what you have today is the result of it, which is people broadcasting their viewpoint and never providing anyone else's viewpoint in it. There's nothing to say that you can't broadcast your view. Well, the fairness true. doctrine just said, hey, you got to give the other guys. And you know how you could do it? This is how often stations did it. They put, remember a Saturday Night Live, the Emily Lytella thing when they would have, as a courtesy to our viewers, and here's Emily Lytella talking, and you'd have Gilda Radner pretending to, to present a letter on the air. That's, that was, was allowable under the Fairness Doctrine. This was always loosely interpreted, but what it did psychologically was make sure that broadcasters, when they went on the air, were cognizant of another uh, viewpoint, which meant that the people hired at networks were a little more experienced worldly, a little more aware of what was going on, and were not glued to a certain, at all times, glued to hey, a certain mindset. Uh, uh, my brother, we we disagree dramatically on the history. Well, of course we do, but I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What do you the, want? I, history, I've been in this business for a I while. I know that, but the history of the fairness doctrine, absolutely we fucking agree. I mean, the government used it to stifle uh, 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 voices, diverse voices. Uh, the Give Radio me Act of, of that. God, Give me the, an the Radio Act of 1927, which was the precursor to the uh, to the to the fairness doctrine. I mean, specifically gave the government the power. That's uh, to not determine the to de hold on it led to the fairness doctrine specifically yes. and and the this was before TV obviously after it led to the fairness doctrine because it wasn't done correctly no That's because it was dramatically abused by people in power to keep out dissenting the voices 1927 yes and then and leading up to 1949 then and, 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 and in fact what led it to the change in, in 1941, Brian, a Supreme Court decision said the broadcaster cannot be an advocate. And the radio industry pushed back, pushed back what? on that. Yeah, Finally, they relented. That 1941 doctrine, the that Mayflower was, decision, which said oh, the Mayflower decision has nothing to do with the fairness doctrine. The it Mayflower led to, decision, it helped lead to the fairness doctrine. The, it what led to the fairness doctrine was the fact that. It, 
to your point, is people wanted to be able to advocate on the air, right? And and well, so, and, and, but 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 put, it, this is important to put in. Up until then, and through that decision, the government did all they could do to make sure people couldn't advocate on air. Yes, that's why. It, we now that's it. hold on a minute, just so we're clear. That's anathema to you, correct? Like Absolutely. Fox News can be an advocate, MSNBC can be an advocate. I don't care what you advocate for. I, I there are two. We're talking about two different things. First of all, we're talking about opinion versus facts, and we're talking about the infancy and the nascence of of radio. Radio, you know, you, radio nineteen twenty seven was the infancy uh, infancy of well, mass. It, media. it, it mass was the, media, the it was the day. broadcast out there. Yeah, before TV, right. Mass media didn't exist before radio. And in fact, all this wonderful things they talk about, you know, about CNN uh, spearheaded the 24-hour news cycle, that's not true. The 1937 flood in the United States spearheaded the 24-7 news cycle when radio stations got together, clear channel radio stations that weren't limited in the um, in the amount of wattage that they had or their that, you know, you can broadcast an AM radio signal across the country if you're strong enough. So these 50,000 watt radio stations like WHAS uh, in, in Louisville and others across the country had a national reach. And they formed the first broadcasting network, this uh, Columbia Broadcasting Network, CBS. So when the uh, radio, when the flood occurred in 1937 uh, across Mississippi, uh, across the southern United States, these radio stations went wall to wall, twenty four seven. Sometimes just broadcasting where you can go. It wasn't today's type of news. It was like, all right, there's a, at the bank at seventh and eighth. That's where you can gather your stuff and move people. It was it was used, and there was an opinion. And part of the problem was incorrect information was often given, sometimes given without knowledge of the broadcaster. What the fairness doctrine wanted to do was to clean up facts not to clean up uh, the clean up the presentation of facts so that people could make qualified decisions. Yeah, but, 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 but yeah. Brian, stop. That's, oh, fun. That's fundamentally oh. flawed. Go ahead. No, it's not fundamentally flawed. Who's, Anyone, I, don't want the, I don't want the government determining what they is don't a determine. fact. They, I, I'm not they asking. Yank no, licenses no, that's not they, what it's about. No, go ahead. They, it's not about determining. The government doesn't determine the facts. The government gives you the pathway to determine the facts. If the if there's a if you're a clean paved street versus one that's a dead end, and the government was saying no dead ends, clean. No, path. the government can yank your license if they don't think you're presenting balanced exactly. views of any fact. No, did it ever happen? And that's bullshit. It, well, did it never it, happen. Yes, it happened no. a lot, Brian. That's no, the, it never happened. Tell me one oh. time. When any ABC affiliate, any NBC affiliate, any CBS affiliate, any Fox affiliate ever lost their license because Brian, they violated Brian, that act. Thousand, All it did was give the government saying, look, guys, say whatever the fuck you want. But if, if, if the people have decided that. Yeah, everyone right. But that's not the accurate history. Brian. What, the, what, what the intent was of the fairness doctrine. That, and in uh, fact, eliminating the fairness doctrine led to the monopolies that we have today. It was a huge mistake in doing it, and it is it has taken away voices rather than add voices. Give me now. I'm not saying the fairness doctrine was perfect. In fact, I would love to change a lot of it. But the idea behind it to make sure that everyone has a voice is doesn't limit free speech. It enhances free speech. I, and the, who is you, you, and who is to regulate that? The government. We the people. We say we want everyone to have a voice. There's nothing wrong. You don't disagree with that, right? Yes, I do. Well, well no, 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 no. I disagree on how to get that. I don't want the government determining what our diverse viewpoints. Uh-uh. And Brian, the entire- you want the free market to do that? Yes. Only the, the, the market. Have, have only the market. what's happened? Don't you bitch about what's going on in news today? No, not like you do. I, no, no, I, no, I, you I can pick no, and stop, stop. Brian, you I can pick like and choose. News, right? No, you no, don't but, get to pick and choose. There's no choices. You have Brian, the illusion. There are more choices today. No, there are no choices. There this are fewer choices. There wait, 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 wait. As an American consumer, Brian Karam, you may not like the choices, but you're telling me today, as an American consumer, I've got fewer choices than our great grandparents did or our grandparents did? 
Bullshit. Today, yes, of course you have fewer choices. Today. Let, let me ask mm. you a question, Joe. When you mm. go to how many different uh, – do you think you really have a choice if you go to a car dealership and you decide you want a Mustang or a Ford or th- th- you have 18 different v- uh, types of Fords, but there's only one Ford company, yes? How many, how many different uh, – when you go to buy a car at, at a Chevy, how many different types yeah, but- of Chevys do you get? I That's can, the same thing. When I come you home are, from you have the oh, bull, illusion, bull, 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 bull. you have the illusion of choice. Oh, bull! When I come no, home, no, it's from, not bull. It's a fact. Well, six companies own everything that you right. see, reader here, and those six companies, I'll guarantee. I know what you want. You don't want, and I don't want. By the way, the the idea of a liberal media that there. No, that I, you, I don't. I, I don't either. I don't care. I don't care about that. I do. I, I, I want I want vetted factual information. And I guarantee you those six people, those six companies with a board that is mostly made of, of white men like ourselves care very little about anything other than profit. If facts are not sellable, they don't want them. And you, that's you, the you, you, your, your six grand corporations that own 95 percent of the media in this country, 90%. even under those umbrellas, there's great diversity. But then, no, but no, then, Brian, yes, there I've is great there. diversity. There is no point. diversity. There's great diversity it, in view. No, there is no diversity. And then it, I can go, it, Brian, it, I can go online and go anywhere the fuck I want to go to get different information. You're delusional. It's not information. I can't go online. It's right. not if, you it's don't not like the information. You and I both agree it's not vetted factual information. Brian. You know damn well that there are things that are online that are not vetted and not factual. Yes. And there are things online that are vetted and are factual. And by the way, Brian, who's going to determine what great board in the sky is going to determine this is vet, vetted exactly. and this is factual? My point exactly. So, so then how are you going to get there? Diversity of ownership, more newspapers, more nor, more reporters in the field. And look, when I speak about How newspapers, do you bring back more newspapers, Brian. Uh, when I speak lie. about newspapers today, let's be honest about what newspapers are. If you're a media owner today, you are a multimedia. You have to exist on multimedia platforms. Part of it is the written word because some people simply don't like to pick up, you know, the internet and get their news that way. But most of us do. So you're a streaming service, you're a blog service, you're a radio station, you're a television station. In any way that you can present information, that's a media owner today. And to do that at the local level, if you were going to, for example, do it in Montgomery County, which we're both familiar with, if you were going to have a local media broadcaster or, or newspaper there today, you would have to have a staff of about 12 people plus sales to afford to do that. You better be able to sell your, sell your ass online. And, and if you are a, uh, clearing market, Brian, no, you're wrong. I've I've been in that on that, Joe, you're dead wrong. I have done the market. market, There'd be, there'd be people. No, no, there were the people. We're the people then. The reason why you don't have it being sold today is the barrier to entry. To make it happen, you have to have a sufficient amount of money to do it. Okay. Your time out, your uh, your profit margin is going to be low, nine percent to ten percent, like a local restaurant, and you have to be sustainable for two to three years. Now, if you're going to do that, you better have you an become- audience. Well, you will have an audience. There are people that if, you say if you, that, Brian. But wouldn't wouldn't smart well, people, I, Brian? I, you're I, smart. Wouldn't smart people be in? I ran one of them for I, I ten know, years. I know. Wouldn't a lot of smart people, if this were a market no. opportunity? And the reason why is because the profit margin isn't high enough for those who have the money to invest. There is no incentive from the government. Why they all? So, so in fact, the incentive for the government is just the opposite. They don't want eyes on them. So everything that the government does is to create a barrier to entry. You talk about the free market, they have bottled the free market. They will not allow the market to be free. The very arguments that you make are mine. I want the free market to decide. The free market doesn't decide because the government has decided for us. So, 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 well, Brian, you, you couldn't go out and buy a local newspaper tomorrow? 
Yes, I can. Then do it. What, no, I, no, not, not do it, but then do it and make a go of it. It's really hard to do. Why? Because I don't think you could get sufficient readership. I, I did it for no 10 market. years and got to, and not only that, increased the readership and beat the Washington Post. It was the owner of the publication that decided that she wanted to move in a different wow. direction. But it wasn't profitable, correct? It was profitable. It wasn't profitable enough. Oh. Okay. Um, I just, Bri, I, I think... Uh, Look, you want to really create local news? You no. Need to get tax incentive. You do want local news, Joe. You want to know, uh, by the way, do you want to know if this, if your local taxes are too much? I want, want people, I want people to demand local news. I don't want to create something. People need to demand it. And then there'll people be a market. People need to know what it is to demand what they don't know they don't have. So then people not- need to get off their ass and get informed. And well, you're not going to in, get informed unless there's someone there to inform you. What's this? The chicken or the egg? At the end of the day, newspapers began because they were political hacks. They were political propagandists for each individual politician had a newspaper, right? And then at some point in time, we decided we were above all that. And we created an environment that had sports, weather, features, news. People liked it. By that point in time, we had established ourselves as a force in nature, the fourth estate, what the government has done systematically over the last 40 years is destroy the watchdog role of the press and in order to make them propagandist once again. And that's a fact. Now, you can argue it, slice it any way you want, pal. Well, but I at do. the end of the day, and I love you, you know I do, but at the end of the day, being in this, being in this business for more than 40 years, I can tell you there is a demand. I've seen it. People ask it. They don't oftentimes understand that it's a demand for news. It's a demand for how come I didn't know that was going on? What happened in my city? What? Why? You mean what? You mean uh, if I go down the street and I want to buy this, it's illegal now? When did that happen? Oh, wait a minute. I want to go to the doctor and I've got to pay, what, $150 for this fee now? Why did that happen? You it's talk what's about happening a, in your Brian, life is a disconnect between you, us providing the information, the information that you need. The government created the disconnect, and you're you, you, you're a part of it now, Joe. You don't see where there's a connection between what you want and and the government taking it away from you. I as 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 I look at this history, and thank God, Brian, by the way, that the government is in the 90s began to regulate the internet like they regulated print throughout history because the print media throughout history stayed much more diverse over the last century than broadcast radio and TV because the government regulated print a lot less. The government over-regulated broadcast, which made broadcast radio and TV... Well, in the fairness doctrine is part of that regulation to me, oh, which made oh I my god, Ryan, it. which I, made I which made broadcast much less diverse when it comes to viewpoints. Oh, what made broadcasting much less diverse I is the same problem you. that you're now much less diverse in broadcasting today, because there are very few owners of broadcasting today, and so what you have are people going, how do I make money? But it became much less diverse back in way back in the day. It yes, and it started got, forty years ago. No, before forty years ago, now. it started. It started when government really began to regulate the only broadcast cat out there, which was radio, and then tried to do the no. same thing in TV. You're, you're you're misled, and you don't understand the business. Okay, okay. <laughs> I love you, but that's not true. Um. It, Oh, right. We, we, you and I, again, I love this because this is right up your bailiwick, but my God, the fairness doctrine. Uh, uh, you want to you want to waste all the time on the fairness doctrine. That's just merely a part of the problem. And, and I agree that it is a problem. The greatest problem that you have today in journalism and in broadcasting is that there are very few companies that own very much what you See, so what's here. your answer? What's your answer to that? Bust up the media monopolies. Bust up the monopolies. That's wow. a little bit of well, it's it's the antitrust legislation that's on the book, and this is where I get pissed off at at the current president who claims that you know we've got a you know he's always talking about busting up monopolies everywhere except in my uh, uh, business. 
It's like we have too many monopolies in, you know, in uh, oil and too many monopolies in cars. Yeah, yeah, sure. Too many monopolies in in my business. There Brian, are give me many. one. Give me one of those monopolies. What's one of those monopolies? Disney. Oh yeah. So Disney, Disney owns uh, Disney owns how many media everything? entities? <laughs> okay, Disney but, owns everything. Right, right, That's, right. But again, if you if you did uh, uh, Disney's uh, chart. And you filter down to all the hundreds of different media outlets that Sinclair Disney owns. Sinclair is another one. Sinclair huh? owns too many. Sinclair owns. Oh, okay, hold on. Focus on Disney first. Oh, hundreds of different media entities. Within those hundreds of different media entities, you've got diversity of thought. You've got diversity of. It may not be oh, enough no. for you, you but it's not all any? like there's one great have Disney. You for any of these? Every. Are you telling me, Brian Karam, that every fucking one of the hundreds of entities Disney owns, they all put out the same line? Come on. Have you? Come on. Come on. Let's see. Sinclair, the same line? Sinclair puts out. Puts uh, out you keep going to Sinclair, but you I'll avoid go, Disney. I'll go back to Disney. Sinclair will put out a two or three minute package. It has to play on every Sinclair station. Oh, I Sinclair know. I'm familiar with Sinclair. Yeah, I right. agree with that. Disney. When you are hired for Disney, there is a certain amount of autonomy allowed to a point. The same with Fox. People go, Fox News this, Fox News that. No, no. I worked at Fox. All right. I worked for America's Most Wanted. Any dictatorial thing that came down was a certain there was a certain play to it. But we did have pushback. The point being is, if you believe that today we have diversity in the media, you are sad. You are you're delusional because it's not. Take a look at who gets hired, the mindset behind it. Joe, you should have this show on a on a network. It will never be on a network. Well, it w- and I would argue, problem. I would argue, it would be if it were profitable. And it, you don't know. And you it's keep saying, be. and Brian, I'm you out. keep saying it can out. be profitable. How do you know it's going to be profitable unless it's on the network? Well, if, you've got to give it a try. Well, no, no, and no. Then no you it, have it, people sell it. But see, that's, that's you have. You don't even get that possibility. You, if you're waiting for a guarantee, who who would guarantee the light bulb was going to be profitable? Who guaranteed that right. you know you tried the Edsel and it failed? Right, you right, right. But we live in a time right now where I don't necessarily need to go to a network. I could go straight to I'm YouTube talking, if I thought you know, I had. Damn something. well, I'm talking about you as a rhetorical. Right, and you. Uh, there are a lot of yous out there uh, in this media field who are going direct to people. And there are so many different independent outlets today, now, primarily because of the internet. To my point, exactly. Which You're making great. my point for me. <laughs> you have to go outside of those six companies to be heard. And some people have success doing it and others do not because the, it's the no- notoriety. And that's why you have people being as notorious as possible to be recognized to get you know their own fifteen minutes of fame and to gather all their uh, their, their supporters and their viewers, whereas if you had a diversity of ownership, you would ha- you would not have to do that. You could present the vetted fact. So, so that's also a problem. But I'll, yes, uh, you do. Karim, I'll give you the final word because this has been fun. Um, oh, it's always fun with you, Joe. You know I love you. I know, and it's <laughs> it's, it's mutual. I. Uh, to truly make our country stronger by better informing the masses through a diversity of media ownership and viewpoints. That's kind of your be all end all. That's your mantra. Um, I would argue, and I'll give you the final word to get to that. uh, The market is getting us to that and will get us to that more than any increased government regulation or fairness doctrine or whatever. Well, the fairness doctrine is a bugaboo. If you want to get to, um, if you want to get to that goal, a diversity of viewpoints, if you want a diversity of viewpoints, Ben Bagdickian was right. You need a diversity of ownership to get a diversity of ownership of the barriers that of entry today is damn near impossible. So to increase the, uh, to lower the barriers of entry and to make sure that as many people can start media companies as possible, 
you need to lower that price you need government subsidy of you know tax breaks low interest loans available to those who want to open new media ventures and i would argue brian then let them you said last word here brother and then let sneak in the very last and and then and then let the market decide if the voices cannot be heard then the voices will not be heard and all i would add to that right all i would add to that and then i really will give you the final word all i would add to that is that's happening right now you and i may not like some of these voices hold on let me finish and then jump but the media may be and it is too tribal today but you've got independent voices who have created media empires on both the right and the left a shitload of them out there who are doing really really well so it's in my mind it's already happening yeah you're talking about and and if this really is the last word you're mistaken this about what yours. i what i believe media to be i'm not i think the basis the backbone of all media is local all national yeah. stories are all national stories have a local angle and began locally you have to have reporters in city council meetings more importantly the the kids the reporters at the pta meetings reporters at the kids you're Little a League fucking League. dinosaur you are a the dinosaur people care about those things they do not understand the reason why they don't get those things. And there isn't a mother on the planet who wouldn't love to cut out a picture of her kid at the Little League game and put it on the uh, with a magnet on her fucking refrigerator. There you know are you so- sound like, you know what you sound like? This is going to hurt. And you're going to throw something at me right now. Go ahead. <laughs> you sound like one of my MAGA Trump supporters who says, I want 1954 back. No, I don't want 1954 back. And, and I... And, but look, I, some, some of what, see, they're misplaced. I understand, <laughs> I understand some of what they're upset about. They don't understand that it isn't, that the government has rat fucked them for 40 years. If you bring back local community newspapers and build from those, you build communities instead of tearing them down. National media does nothing. The broadcasters do nothing but tear you down. And we got distracted on on basically you know the the, uh the fairness doctrine which is more about yeah it what this is really more about that's and then that's so minor in comparison it's such a minor point to argue about when people care about look if i told you joe uh you got a, a red light traffic ticket the other day yeah yeah i did brian uh how much does it cost 150 dollars ah 150 why does it cost 150 dollars for running that red light cam i don't know but i'm going to pay it do you know where that money goes no no brian brian do you know i'm asking you do you know where the money goes i, if I could can, probably I, break down some of it but not to a t but i i and, and i'm somewhat I, i'll guarantee you most you people have no clue all. most people have no clue but and brian, they care. But but did, brian wait a minute. last word ahead. here so i'm gonna i'm gonna take it and run with it you don't know right it's the local reporter that tells you. And here's what the local reporter is going to tell you from covering the event. Someone who's trained to, to gather information and will talk to all sources and will f- go to the uh, and look online and go to the uh, and look at the actual physical content of, of the law that's passed will tell you that of that $150, 25 to 50 of it will go to your local government. You know where the rest of it goes? It goes to the company that supplies the equipment to see your... I was going to uh, guess 50-50. It's not. Often not. But here's the scary part about that money. That, 70, that 60, 70%, and this is in Montgomery County, and we did this story. This is not, this is not speculation. That money that goes to that company that supplied the traffic cam is a wholly owned subsidiary of a company out of... of Florida, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of a company out of New York, which is a wholly owned subsidiary out of a company in London, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Bin Laden group. Um, now, 
you need to know that information and you want to know the information, but you don't know that you want to know that information until the information is provided to you. It's the local reporter that does it. It's a local reporter that no longer exists because governments have destroyed okay. local reporting. Okay. You can, and you, if you put those reporters back, that information is there are there is a market for it because you and I both want to know how our money is being spent. We may be busy t getting our kids to soccer practice, but we want it on a street that's paved. We want to make sure we're not getting fucked by our government. We want to make sure that the money that we pay to to our and here's another one. I, I'm doing the shot clock on you. Hurry up. All right, 20 seconds. All right, here's the last one. Clean water. Everybody wants clean water, right? In Montgomery County, you've got a problem with it. It's a problem all over the country, not just Flint, Michigan. And the reason why, because there's no overt regulation that the companies who provide it can't provide it. And in fact, in Washington, D.C., for example, Pepco supplies your electricity, Pepco doesn't own anything Fine. other than transmission lines. You're, you're uh, I'll close. All of this matters to you. I, I, but you're talking about the quality of 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 media today, and I would agree with you that the quality may suck, but you we have a shitload more sources. I would argue even locally, well, hey, hey, and, and even sorry, online it, locally. Shit is shit. People, Just because there's more shit doesn't mean it's, it's good. It's not. Shit. It's not all shit. And generally, it's the market mostly shit, and no, you can't find the market sifts through stuff. No, this you this have amazing to be able to find thing called the trust. internet. You Brian, have if there were. Damn you, if there were a profit to doing this, and I just you, believe there it. is a profit. Oh, we Brian. found a profit. It's not prof it's not profitable enough. Large well, corporations it, want a twenty percent profit. Well that's when, semantics. If it's not profitable enough, nobody's gonna do it. That the large corporations won't do it. And well then but that's like to start at the local level. The, then, okay, the then there's. Doing it to right. you. You're the one bitching about government interference. This is government all interference. All right, all right. Then, then we'll we'll close on that piece of potential common ground. You and I then can put our heads together, and I will listen to you about incentives to maybe get people into this local media world. I'm I'm all, uh, perfectly willing to look at that. Um, that, but but that you cannot force. They're in the book. It's called Free the Press. If you, you want to see the incentives, good, you can, read the book. You but, cannot force a market, and people got to get off their ass. You cannot force a market. That's absolutely right, Brian. You, Karam. People have got to want to buy it, and here's Brian, how. Brian Karam, everybody, follow him on Twitter. He'll piss you off every day, like he pisses <laughs> me off every day. But I love him like a brother. Brian, thank you, man. Always, brother. It's always fun. Thank you for listening. Remember to listen, share, and follow White Flag with Joe Walsh on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere great podcasts are found. And be sure to leave a five-star review. This has been White Flag with Joe Walsh.